I bring the saints here tonight together in prayer, one mind and one accord. I pray for your people. I petition you, your loving, kind Savior, compassionate toward the sick, the afflicted, high priest of God, one we remit our prayers to. Have mercy and have compassion. For these names, these individuals, back of the name is a heart, a soul, a body, a being, a life. Besides these, there's hundreds and thousands and yes, millions of others every nation, in every place. But you know them. You said you did. You know them that are yours. We believe you know tonight. We know that you know. We ask humbly in a spirit of repentance, in a spirit of contriteness, humility, we're not able, but surely you are. You can't, but you can. We don't give miracles, but you do. And we ask you, Lord, to look on this prayer meeting group tonight, this Bible study group, and hear our petition as we pray for the church in general, our own lives, for the families we represent, for the needs among us. We want to thank you for your greatness, your glory. We recognize your sovereignty. We recognize your power, your omnipotence, your omnipresence, your omniscience. We recognize you, Lord, tonight as being our helper. We know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you'll be in the midst of them. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Go with us, Lord. Go with us. Keep us, help us. We pour out our soul, our spirit to you. We bring our body as a living sacrifice tonight, laying upon the altar, laying aside every weight the sin that so easily beset us. We come before you and we bring the sacrifice of praise. We ask you to help us. Help us. Help the church. Help our movement. Help our actions. Help us, Lord, to be holy and separated from sin, righteous, looking for your return, steadfastly watching as the temple of God. Measure us, Lord, with your word. Measure us. Measure our righteousness. Measure our humbleness. Measure uh, the thoughts of our mind. Measure the attitude of our heart. Measure us. Because we want to be in the temple. Part of the temple. Not the courts, Lord. There's no measurement there. But let us be in the temple. The temple of God. The temple of the Holy Ghost. The temple be put together without the sound of a hammer. I ask these things, Lord. I believe these things. And I thank you for these things. Look down upon our children, Lord. That's a sensitive subject with us, Lord. Our children. Not only our children, but our children's children. 
our generations. God, we need you. Our thoughts are not your thoughts. Our ways are not your ways. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to worship. Teach us to praise. Teach us to instruct others. Maybe we Precious name we ask you. Amen. In Jesus' precious name we ask you. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise your Lord. Bless your name. Praise the worthy name of Jesus. Praise the worthy name. The worthy name. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody said, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor. We lift your name. We exalt you. Praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I thought this little saying was real good. I'd rather be a could be <coughs> if I cannot be an R A R E. Because a could be is a maybe who is reaching for a star. I'd rather be a has been than a might have been by far. For a might have been has never been. But I has been, was once, now. I like that. Little rhymes make sense, don't they? And then I wanted to read, this came out in the summer of 2007, in the flame. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Orange Barry, whole rain. That's what I need. Yeah. <laughs> That's your diet. That's my diet. <laughs> 32 milligrams of omega 3. Mr. Marlowe, would you uh, like to take care of these? Uh, <laughs> Sister Joyce, just what I need. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Joe. This is, um, this is the flame that came out in uh, 2007. And uh, Brother Ferris and I both had articles here on the time of salt and light. And I'll read a couple of paragraphs from his. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 13, reads, You're the salt of the earth. And in verse 14 it said, You're the light of the world. Christ had lately called his disciples and told them that they should be fishers of men. Now, here he tells them, Father, what he designed them to be the salt of the earth and the lights of the world that they might be indeed what it was expected they should be. Jesus told his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. This would encourage and support them under their sufferings though they should really be blessings to the world. The people of this world are wicked, sinful, and against God. They glory in their shame, and even today, many are coming out 
proudly declaring their lesbianism, homosexuality, and other deviant lifestyles. Evil has become good, and good has become evil. Christ was telling his disciples they, as Christians, were to be, were to function like salt in the world. They were different from the world, like the world. They had also been dead, but were delivered from their spiritual death by the power of God and made alive by their relationship with Jesus Christ. And in my article that I wrote in this flame of 2007, perhaps at no time in the history of man has the season of salt and light been so urgently needed in our society as it is now. When I think of salt, I think of two areas, taste and preserving. 2,000 years ago, the carpenter of Galilee used this expression, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. Have we also said if the salt loses its savor or its taste, and its preserving power. It is good for nothing. He also added, if the light that is in you be darkness, how great is the darkness? I think I can say, without being overbalanced, that we, the church, speaking in a collective manner, have lost our savor and our ability to be the great shining light of the age we live in. I saw a sermon announcement on a church sign recently announcing a pastor's message for Sunday, and it was titled, Can God Bless America Any Longer? America is a nation that has lost its way because it's lost its relationship with God, a nation that has no morals left, a nation that has no clear policy, in war and peace, a nation that no longer leads the world in scientific development, in educational values, in social morals, but does lead the world in murders, suicides, and drugs, and so on. That was in the flame in 2007. So maybe someone read that and got help those words spoken in print four years ago. Think of that. Romans, the book of Romans, we've been studying that. And we are going to continue in the first chapter of Romans. And we're going to locate whom Paul is speaking to in Verse 16, 18 rather, where we finished the last time um, in Romans 1 and 18. I, I'm going to reiterate this because we went over this, but I want to catch up. I'm going to read down from 18 to verse uh, 25, where we left off. And picture this as being the judgment of God on man against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So they had to have a revelation of God for God to judge them as holding the truth. But they held the truth in unrighteousness. Truth does you no good if you hold it in an unholy life or an unrighteous life or an evil life. Truth does you no good. It doesn't set you free. Someone said truth sets you free. It does if you know the truth and practice the truth. But if you don't know the truth and practice the truth, it cannot set you free if you hold it in carnality, 
unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, Paul is speaking to the age of the antediluvian world that God judged in the flood. This book of Romans covers the first um, 2,000 years of man's existence outside the Garden of Eden in transgression and in sin. They knew God. God showed himself to them. They understood the Godhead of God the Father and Christ the Lord God. They were without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, see these people know God, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. They know God, they're without excuse. Because that when they knew God, so this is past tense now, Paul is showing this is not the Roman church. This is not people that were contemporary with Paul, but this is a generation of the earth past that has been judged. And he said, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. From the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, to Cain, to Nimrod, to Ham, and the sons of Ham, that world was uh, corrupt, and God judged them up to Noah, the antediluvian before the flood world. God judged them in the flood. And then Ham continued that unrighteousness after the flood. So then God had to judge Sodom and Gomorrah because Sodom and Gomorrah was a product of the sins of Ham uh, that he committed against his father. Uh, so this generation was judged. And Paul said they knew the truth. They held the truth in unrighteousness. God showed it to them. But they became vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart was darkened. Their understanding was darkened. Confessing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. They developed idolatry. They changed uh, everything they saw into their imagination of what they thought God might look like because they had lost favor with God, they lost understanding with God, and they didn't know what God looked like anymore. So they made vain imagination. They changed the glory. They did not change God. They did not change God into corruption. They changed his glory because they were the glory of God. Should have been the glory of God. Man should have been the glory of God. But he changed it into an image made like unto idolatry or birds and four-footed uh, beasts and creeping things. Um, the bull god that Egypt worshipped around, um, the god of fertility, uh, they worshipped that god with other gods. That's what he's talking about here. Wherefore then God also gave them up. 
God gave them up. That is, that's a very powerful statement. You know, when God gives up a generation, they're lost. They're doomed. They're damned. When God gives up anyone, they're gone. They're history. They're judged. Uh, and God gave them up. He said, no more covenant, no more mercy. He just gave them up. And that's what I'm teaching now in the church. That's the present lesson I'm giving. That God is separating the temple from the court. Everything that's in the court, God's giving it up. He isn't measured. It will either wind up the death of the ungodly, or in the resurrection, or in Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon, or they'll come forth at the end of the thousand years. Millions and millions and millions of people will come forth at the end of the thousand years and populate the earth for a season. Some of them to life everlasting, living on this earth, in, as I taught Sunday, a terrestrial body, because celestial bodies belong to angelic creation. Earthly creation is terrestrial. Terra firma means the earth, doesn't it? the ground you walk on is terra firma. Man is terra firma. He, he's terrestrial. He's earthly. And if he doesn't bear the image of the heavenly, he'll remain uh, terrestrial. So God is not going to measure the hordes of people. Someone said, you mean God is not concerned about them? He gives them up. There's no more plan for them but death. No more plan for them but destruction. That's all he has. Uh, he has a plan of salvation for those that are the temple of the Holy Ghost. When God gave me that revelation, that revelation in Revelation 11, I saw that clearly. He said, but the court which is without Without where? Without the holy place. Without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Baptism of the Holy Ghost gives you a holy place in your life. That's why Ephesians 4 and 29 and 30 said, Paul said in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, 29th verse, 30th, breathe not, breathe not the Holy Spirit. Breathe not the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. You keep grieving the Holy Ghost, grieving the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost can be taken from you. It will flee because the Holy Ghost doesn't dwell in an unclean temple. It will not dwell in an unclean temple. An unclean temple is not an imperfect man or woman. That's not an imperfect person. You can be an imperfect man or woman and be a clean temple for God to dwell in. The Holy Ghost, you're just imperfect. You're not unclean, you're imperfect. Uh, but 